At the end of August, satellite imagery picked up blobs of light in Russia, near St. Petersburg. Russia was flaring, or burning, huge quantities of gas, normally destined for the European market. Since the start of its invasion of Ukraine, Nord Stream 1 has been shut down, and gas shipments from Russia have collapsed to nearly zero. This has caused significant amounts of economic pain, with entire sectors in Europe being offline, particularly for the most energy-intensive ones. Politicians in Europe are saying that Europeans should bear the cost of freedom while going full damage control mode. European countries have announced intrusive market interventions to protect its industries and its consumers, with subsidy packages running in the tens of billions. As they say, les jeux sont faits, the games are set for Europe's most challenging winter since the 1970s oil shocks. So what will be the cost of freedom for Europe? To answer this question, let's first discuss where we are right now. Russia has almost entirely cut off Europe's gas supply, and the European Union needs to both reduce consumption and find alternative sources from which to import natural gas. Back in June, the EU announced gas consumption cuts of 15% for EU countries, though these were mostly voluntary, except in Germany, which took it a step further with planned cuts of up to 20%. However, the gas cuts for several EU countries have not gone nearly as far as they need to. On average, consumption has been cut by around 10%, rather than the 15% that is needed. And some countries have actually increased gas consumption. Let's compare three scenarios looking into gas consumption at different levels. In a business-as-usual situation, Europe's gas reserves would be largely insufficient. With 10% reductions, Europe could get by, even if Russia stops all shipments of gas. 15% cuts, on the other hand, give additional room for maneuver in the event of a colder winter. Another EU measure is that gas reserves are legally bounded to be filled at least up until 80% by the 1st of November. This strategy has been successful, allowing the EU to fill its gas reserves ahead of schedule, although at great cost. Since the EU imported expensive liquid natural gas instead of cheap Russian gas, it ended up paying six times as much to fill those gas reserves as it did in previous years. While essential, these gas reserves aren't enough to last the whole winter unscathed. So how big is Europe's shortfall? What's important to understand is that while gas production is roughly constant throughout the year, gas consumption isn't. There's simply more demand in winter, since one of the main uses for natural gas is to heat homes. Gas storage is filled during the summer, when demand is lower. And then in the winter, it draws extra demand from its reserves, on top of its baseline imports. So even if the EU storage is full, the fact that gas imports are constrained still form a major problem. While on paper the EU does have enough capacity to import natural gas from alternative sources, the continent's infrastructure is just poorly connected, particularly since the Iberian gas market is isolated from the rest of Europe. And since gas pipelines get smaller the further west you go, it's impossible to bring gas imported from the west eastwards. And because of this, the International Monetary Fund expects there to be a gas shortage of roughly 10% of the EU's consumption for this year. This shortfall in natural gas actually leads to another problem. Energy prices, which are linked to natural gas in general, have skyrocketed. And this isn't because coal, solar, and nuclear power plants suddenly became more expensive. Let's look at it this way. If natural gas becomes more expensive, the price of electricity produced with natural gas becomes more expensive. And since there can be only a single price for electricity, all the other power plants get to sell their electricity at a higher price, netting record profits for electricity producers and sky-high energy bills for electricity consumers. But gas shortages and sky-high electricity prices don't affect every country equally. Geography, infrastructure, and supply routes all affect the gas shortage problem. Those that are either more reliant on natural gas in general or have no alternatives to Russian pipelines due to infrastructure bottlenecks, will have it the worst. Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Hungary, which receive their gas almost entirely from Russia, either through Ukraine or Germany, and have no alternatives, are set to see shortfalls of up to 40% this winter, while Germany, Italy, and Austria will likely see shortfalls of 15%. Although on a side note, Hungary has concluded a bilateral deal with Russia to secure its own gas supply and could stave off some of the effects of the gas shortage. While not all countries are affected directly by the gas shortage, every country will be affected by the knock-on effects. These come from the high energy prices as a result of the gas shortage, but also the interconnection of different EU countries, particularly Germany, the EU's largest economy. If Germany's economy shuts down, other EU countries are impacted as well. The IMF is tabled on recessions between 0.5% for the most insulated countries, all the way up to 4% for some of the most vulnerable countries, if nothing is done. Just as an indication, the recession in 2009 was 4%. But as previously mentioned, this recession won't affect EU countries on the same level. On another side note, it's important to mention that Russia's own recession is set to reduce the size of its economy by 10% next year, according to leaked Russian documents. 
and with CNN reporting that 72% of US economists expect a recession next year, economic turmoil is here on a global scale, affecting people all around the world. However, just like governments are adapting to the energy crisis, so are people whose wealth is at risk. A study last year by Ernst Young into the investment practices of the very wealthy found that 8 in 10 ultra high net worth individuals were already investing outside of stocks. The New York Times writes, when the stock markets take a dive, people invest in art because the contemporary art market has near zero correlation to stocks and its appreciation has outpaced the S&P 500 return for the last 26 years by more than double. Masterworks, the sponsor of this video, deals in that very same art and as a result, they're dealing with more demand than ever before, allowing you to invest in world-renowned artists like Picasso or Banksy for a fraction of the full price. So far, they've sold six paintings for an average net return of 29% for their investors. And they've done so well that there's actually a waiting list to join their 500,000 members. But you can skip it by clicking on the link in the description down below. While this economic impact means job losses and factories on standstill, if action isn't taken, it would push many firms to go out of business, which would be catastrophic for the EU's economic position on the long run. Fortunately, it's possible to alleviate some of that pain. Let's go back to the EU's two main problems, the gas shortage and the high energy prices. There isn't enough gas in the European Union, and overall, that's not changing. In the short term, there are two ways to make this less painful. The first is to reduce the EU's gas consumption in a controlled manner, and the second is to shuffle around the gas that the European Union does have. While industry is already reducing demand on its own, with factories reducing production or shutting off because it's too expensive to produce. But it's possible to manage this in a way to protect smaller businesses, which are at higher risk of bankruptcy. In Germany's plan for gas emergency for this winter, it has decided to prioritize on those very small businesses. If the situation gets bad, it's something that other European countries are likely to copy. Households are also being asked to reduce temperatures in their homes by one, two, or even three degrees to help with the shortfall. And gas sharing, particularly between and to the most effective countries, like this deal between France and Germany, can reduce the economic impact. Another measure is to start up mothballed coal and nuclear power plants to save up on natural gas normally used for electricity production. And then there's the tackling of high energy prices, which means separating the price of energy from the price of natural gas. The way the EU intends on doing this is by putting profit caps on non-gas power sources and using that money to finance billion dollar packages for industry and consumers, in effect subsidizing their energy use. This will reduce the impact primarily on companies, countries and consumers that don't directly use gas, like electricity consuming firms, which are penalized while the electricity could be cheaper with renewables or nuclear. There's also been some talk about putting price caps on imports of Russian gas. But should the EU do this, Russia has threatened to cut off all remaining gas exports to Europe. If the EU is able to tackle those two problems, it will lead to a smaller recession and it having a preserved industry. Models from the IMF indicate that by implementing some of these measures, a recession might be kept at around 1% for the whole of the EU, rather than the 2% currently predicted. However, it's important to note the cost of the EU's damage control and the contradiction between tackling its two problems, both in the long and short term. In the short term, making energy cheaper through subsidies means increasing demand and therefore aggravating the shortage. Protecting consumers means taking gas away from industry. And price caps will reduce the ability of the EU to import natural gas, especially if Russia cuts off flows. In the long term, reducing pain now this winter means prolonging Europe's gas dependency into the future. But if EU countries don't make these choices, then its industry will go bankrupt. So of course, there's still a lot we don't know. There's still uncertainty around the weather and the extent to which countries will prioritize consumers and households above industry. And there are also still questions about how the EU's adaptations will work. Other measures will still kick in this winter, like France's plan to restart nearly all of its nuclear reactors, which were down for maintenance, or the possibility for the Netherlands to reopen the Groningen gas field. And this is still not the end of the road for Europe's gas problems. And because of the time it takes to build additional infrastructure, it means that the winter of 2023 will be just as bad or even worse than this one. It will take until 2024 or even 2025 before Europe's energy prices finally stabilize. In that time, the EU has to diversify into as many other energy resources as possible, including renewables, nuclear energy, or even alternative natural gas. This was Interrupt. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you'd like to support the channel, make sure to check out my Patreon link down below. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to Geert and Yuri who helped me in making this video.